Hello, everyone, and welcome to the sixth webinar of the Japanese Studies and Anti-Racist Pedagogy Project Series. My name is Rachel Willis, and I am co-coordinator of this project, along with Sophie Hasuo, Harrison Watson, and Professor Reginald Jackson. Before I introduce our speaker for today, I would like to briefly explain the format of this event and then give some announcements. Your microphones and cameras have been disabled. We invite you to submit questions during the lecture through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and our moderator will try to get through as many of them as possible after Dr. Rivas' presentation. As for announcements, next Thursday, June 3rd, we will be welcoming Professor Jayanti Selinger at noon to give a talk entitled, Getting Started, Challenges and Opportunities in Anti-Racist Pedagogy in Pre-Modern Japanese Literature. You can find the registration link for that event as well as the full webinar schedule on our website. The Japanese Studies and Anti-Racist Pedagogy Project, which centers graduate students and faculty of color as key partners and co-organizers of this intellectual enterprise, is designed to develop a forum for discussing and promoting anti-racism within the field of Japanese studies. The project's broader aim is to enhance awareness and quality of teaching related to diversity, equity, and inclusion issues within Japanese studies, with an explicit emphasis on anti-racist pedagogy as the basis for public-facing humanities research and professional development for graduate students. That said, it is my pleasure to announce our speaker for today, Dr. Zeladith Rivas, Associate Professor of Japanese at Marshall University. Professor Rivas received her master's and PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and has taught at Marshall University, the Kentucky Institute for International Studies, Grinnell College, and Colorado College. She's also given talks across North and South America, as well as in Japan and Europe. Professor Rivas has been the recipient of fellowships and grants from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Fulbright Hayes Fellowship Program, and the UC Berkeley Center for Japanese Studies, to name a few. Her work focuses on trans-Pacific connections and mixed race experiences, particularly in the literature of the Japanese diaspora. Professor Rivas has published articles in comparative literature studies, the Journal of Asian American Studies, the Journal of Intercultural Studies, and more. Her current project expands upon the themes of her existing body of work, highlighting postmodernism in Japanese Brazilian novels and their relation to the neoliberal Japanese state. Her forthcoming book is entitled Migrant Circuits, Japanese in Brazil, Brazilians in Japan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zeladith Rivas, whose talk is entitled Multiculturalism in Japan, The Contradiction of Samba Matsuri. Hi everyone, I am going ahead and starting to share because the technical side is always what eludes everyone. Um, but I am happy to be here today and happy to chat with you. Um, so I wanted to thank you everyone for being here today. In particular, I wanted to uh, thank Sophie, Rachel, Harrison, and Dr. Reginald Jackson and everyone at the University of Michigan Japanese Studies Center. Um, this research, like Rachel uh, spoke about, is part of my larger book project, Migrant Circuits, Japanese in Brazil, Brazilians in Japan, and an article I'm currently working about on about postmodern depictions of Dekaseki. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start um, so the title of my talk today is Multiculturalism in Japan, The Contradiction of Samba Matsuri. Every time there's a major sports event in Brazil, such as the 2014 FIFA World Cup or the 2016 Summer Olympics, foreign presses look on and highlight the Japanese Brazilian immigrant population in Japan and Brazil as a contradiction. For the media, the population is a consumable other that can mesmerize audiences while also becoming a commodity that can be marketed as globalization. There's a perceivable sensationalism portrayed in the media that highlights sumo who, wrestlers who like to drink caipirinhas as singular identities. Capitalizing on the media's attention on Brazil, Japanese towns with Brazilian populations offer festivals that showcase Brazilian food, music, and dance. These festivals epitomize Japanese new multiculturalism. 
That is, the presentation of the Japanese Brazilian community emphasizes diversity in a, matter, in a manner that highlights a performance of proximity and distance. Announcements are in Japanese, linguistically claiming Japanese-ness, while using sporadic Portuguese and dancing samba to bring attention to their Brazilianness. This multicultural performance of identity disavows past depictions of Japanese homogeneity by privileging the immigrant body and its search for socioeconomic mobility, not typically associated with Japanese Brazilian dekasegi. And the term dekasegi, I'll be using it throughout today. And this term in particular means foreign laborers. These shifts in racial and class categories emerge from a new visibility of Japan's foreign residents in the media. They are readily consumable by Japanese fans in small doses through public performances that allow them proximity to an other while maintaining a distant from this other. These Brazilian festivals emphasize changing demographics of Japan's population, one in which immigrant foreign bodies emerge from the national narratives that privilege a Japanese homogeneity. There, these festivals are often announced with Brazilian flags or colored in the uh, colors of the Brazilian flag, yellow and green, performing a type of Brazilianness. This Brazilianness then becomes an expendable commodity that is easily marketable. For example, Mitsukoshi's, uh, Ginza's Mitsukoshi department store advertised a pop-up event in 2015 as Brazil Fantástico. Here they sold uh, caipim dourado jewelry, Havaiana flip-flops, beer, wine, acai bowls, and fruit smoothies, commodifying Brazil with keywords such as a boa vida, the good life, jonetsu, passion, and semedioku, vitality. These items, however, put alongside images of the Amazon and Caipira or country people, introduce a stereotypical Brazil that is not the cosmopolitan global Brazil ready to host the world, but instead commodifies Brazil as part of Japan's multiculturalism. This multiculturalism is typically described as boutique multiculturalism, uh, introduced by Stanley Fish as characterized by its superficial or cosmetic relationship to the objects of its affection. In Japan, the foods and festivals of other cultures are consumed without addressing the day-to-day -day interactions of these cultures. More importantly, however, the marketing of Brazil through these items and festivals allows Japanese consumers to access performances of gender, race, nation, and class without ever leaving Japan. It introduces a multiculturalism that commodifies the diversity of people, cultures, and languages already present in Japan. So today I wanted to go ahead and talk about the consumption of this Brazilian national imaginary in Japan. Um, not And this imaginary comes through not as a country of poverty and crime, but as a Brazil fantástico. Um, it's one and the other simultaneously. Uh, I argue that the use of samba in Matsuri stereotypes contrasts and further essentializes Japan's multiculturalism in its presentation of a sexualized, racialized Brazilian musical form. So I'll begin by talking about the Dekasegi identity construction to understand their history and the socioeconomic class perceptions attached to them. Then I use Brazilian festivais to discuss the contentious consumption of Brazilian inter Brazilianness internally in the Japanese Brazilian community in Japan. And I compare these to the summer Matsuri, in particular the Asakusa Summer Fe uh, Samba Festival in Japan, to discuss how Japanese audiences consume Brazilianness externally. Finally, I return to examine Samba as a way of bringing visibility to the community 
through the fantastical presentation of uh, Samba in uh, Shio, Shiozaki Shohei's Akaneiro no Yakusoku, Samba do Kingyo. The English title of this film is Goldfish Go Home, and it was released in 2012. So Japanese immigrants arrived in Brazil in 1908 as labor for coffee plantations. Um, as three-year contract laborers who would soon return to Japan, their identity began to waver when they encountered uh, President Getulio Vargas's 1930s politics. During this time, his regime established and highlighted multiple policies that highlighted Brasilidade or Brazilianness, seeking to establish a singular national identity. In these particular campaigns, Vargas's regime embraced Afro-Brazilian culture as icons of Brazilianness, emphasizing soccer, samba, and the mulata, the mixed race, mixed race black and white woman. Caught amidst assimilationalist policies and decline of coffee prices, Japanese immigrants found it increasingly difficult to return to Japan. After Brazil sided with the Allied powers during, the, during World War II, many decided to call Brazil home. Again, this is an oversimplification. So there's a lot more that goes into it, but you know, this is what we can do in a short webinar. Uh, beginning in the late 1980s, Br Japanese Brazilians returned to Japan as ethnic return migrants in response to Brazil's post-dictatorship unemployment and hyperinflation, as well as Japan's need for unskilled labor. With an increased population of illegal immigrants, of illegal workers, the Japanese diet passed the 1989 Revised Immigration Control and Refugee Recognition Act law, allowing for a new category of long-term long residents for Nikkei, or people of Japanese descent who did not have Japanese citizenship. Japan's Brazil Brazilian population peaked at 3,106, uh, 300, uh, I've been practicing so much Japanese numbers with my capstone students that I forgot how to say them in English. 316,967, uh, in 2007 and in 2019, the population was estimated a little over 211,000. This number is reflected in the increased rate of registered foreigners in a seemingly hom uh, homogenous Japan. Today, close to 2% of Japan's population is registered foreigners. Being Nikkei, they are both accepted and rejected by Japanese people. Accepted because they are unskilled laborers in undesirable jobs and rejected because they are not quote unquote pure Japanese, both visibly mixed race and lower eco socioeconomic laborers instead of ethnic brethren. These categories emphasize the population shift in identity categories from an abstract nationalism based on Vargas's Brasilidade to one that is trans-Pacific and emphasizes citizenship, race, and socioeconomic class in Japan. The visibility of the Japanese Brazilian in Japan is often limited to specific towns in larger populations, such as Oizumi in Guma, Hamamatsu in Shizuoka, Toyota in Aichi, and the Gifu suburbs outside of Nagoya. While part of the trade industry work uh, includes working difficult, dangerous, and dirty jobs, this in Japanese is called the three Ks or kitsui, kiken, kitanai jobs. Um, the, they are coexisting beside their Japanese coworkers and neighbors, learning to adapt to written and unwritten rules about life in Japan. And yet the media and politicians often highlight the negative the negative things, such as blaming Japan's rising crime rates on foreigners, despite the fact that uh, Greyburn and Ertl assert, police figures show that they are responsible for less than 2% of violent crimes. Similarly, in her research, Tessa Moris 
Moda Suzuki analyzed the tax awareness advertisement featuring the Brazilian born Japanese nationalized soccer player Ra Ramos Rui. She writes, if you look foreign and yet possess Japanese citizenship, you had better make extra sure you are an exemplary, loyal, law abiding, tax paying citizen. What most media and politicians fail to acknowledge is that Tecasegui laborers are often middle class college graduates in Brazil. When they arrive to Japan, however, Japanese label them as inferior because of Brazil's reputation as a developing country associated with poverty and crime. Jap Japanese Brazilian social alienation in the workplace and communally in Japan causes many to look for job opportunities that afford a rise in socioeconomic status. While the hopes of escaping la labels of inferior, modeling is one of the strategies that is often encouraged. Young Japanese Brazilian women are especially in demand because they visibly perform Japanese as well as global identities. Model Karen Ogata says, depending on the job, I can be really foreign, but I can also be very Japanese when I want to. Audiences recognize the model's identity performance as being both local and global, consuming spaces that celebrate and desire multiculturalism as a means through which to access the economic exchanges encouraged by globalization. The identity performances of Japanese Brazilian models extends to that included in Brazilian festivais, Japanese matsuri, and in Shiozaki's film, allowing for the consumption of Brazilianness that also disavows the positionalities of Dekaseki workers. Audiences consume Brazilianness on stages throughout Japan, while those on stage pursue Brazilianness as a commodity attempting to escape the stereotypes associated with being Dekasegi. On stage, the carnivalization of race, nation, and ethnicity are available for the, for the audience to devour. Inspired on theories of performativity, audience, and minor characters, festivais and matsuri depict how proximity and distance become tools through which fans access multiculturalism, paving the way for a discussion of the profitability of globalization as performed for Japanese fans by, uh, uh, by the samba groups that will dis be discussed later. Unlike diaspora theories, which introduce the traumatic aspects of memory, place, and nation for peoples who cannot return to their home, and cosmopolitanism, which places the city as central, focusing on identities as a site of value exchange, performity th performativity theories highlight the stage as a site through which identity becomes imaginative. Here, performers must believe the act, gestures, and identity that they present in order for fans to consume their performance. Helping us to gain awareness of the role of race in these moments of performativity are the concepts of proximity and auto exoticizing. Asian Americanists Doreen Kondo and Lucy May San Pablo Burns present these by examining the subversive tactics present on the stages of race, na nation, nationalism, and colonialism while highlighting performative moments of visibility and misrecognition. Indeed, the use of full music and dance in Brazilian festivais in Japan began gaining popularity in 2004. Fojo originated in Northeastern Brazil and audiences oftentimes associate it with Festa Juninas or June festivals in which the audiences dress in country clothing similar to the images of the Brazilians included in the Mitsukoshi advertisements previously mentioned. And here you have an example of the two. And uh, you can see that females typically have their hair braided um, and there's some kind of hats going on uh, for both of them. Um, this 
arriving in Japan, these festivals and this music has arrived in Japan via Sao Paulo, exemplifying the new cosmopolitan and global positionalities of Brazil. Moreover, the performance of Fojo in Brazilian festivals stand in contrast to the use of samba in Japanese matsuri. Here, Fojo is a familial affair where musicians play on stage, at clubs, shopping malls, and festivals, encouraging the audience to partake in a momentary release from the day-to-day -day conditions of Degasegi life. For the span of the music, the audience members perform a Brazilian that is largely unknown in Japan, choosing Fojo because for them, it's specifically linked to an auto-exoticizing image of Brazilianness. Auto-exoticism depicts the power that emerges in the participants in their politics of pleasure by illustrating the proximity, identifying each other as kin, and distance, identifying everyone else as other. Performati performativity theorist Judith Butler describes how these concepts allow them to allow us to encounter and know the other. The Brazilian bodies dancing for hall become sites of playfulness to usurp the gaze of those who wish to consume multiculturalism as something that is both a cosmopolitan and global commodity. Here instead, it becomes something locally decasegui and globally Brazilian, kin and other, proximal and distant and distal. On the other hand, samba appears in Japan separate from its original context of Brazilian carnival. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, uh, carnival was born in Europe as a pre-Lenten celebration that emphasized the removing oneself from meat. Um, celebrations of carnival began in the 17th and 18th century when residents threw buckets of mud, water, and food at each other. In 1917, Brazilian samba became associated with Carnival and in 1928, Mangueira um, from Rio de Janeiro became the first bloco or the first contingency to parade through the city as a Carnaval da Rua or a street festival. That was clear, a clearly defined association of people who had gathered together for the specific performance of this parade, um, while the public watches the performers who display themselves. So there's two things going on, right? It's not just the parade itself, but also the audience who is watching them. Um, and this emphasizes the gaze of performativity. Uh, Karen Teyamashita, an Asian Americanist uh, fiction writer, describes the spectac spectacle of Carnival as a brief bacchanal. Uh, a saudade, a nostalgia, or a succumbing of desire, or succumbing to desire. And it is a gathering outside time, or, uh, time and space, as Roberto da Mata describes it, that allows for the release of pleasure. This pleasure wants the sight of a loss, the seam, the cuts, the deflation, the dissolve which seizes the subject in the midst of bliss and therefore recurs as an edge as Roland Barthes describes. It is therefore in this edge that the Japanese Brazilian population is stereotyped, orientalized, fetishized, gendered and consumed as a pleasurable spectacle on the national stage of Japanese Matsuri. Um, so this slide here it, are all images of Japanese, uh, of Asakusa Samba Matsuri, which is a specific Matsuri that I will be describing in a second. Um, Japanese Matsuri have often used Samba as a public display of summer for a Japanese audience that may know nothing about Japan, about Brazil. Um, and what's interesting here, right, if we think about when Carnival starts, um, it's typically some point between February and March um, as a pre-Lenten celebration. Um, and so this shift then to summer marks a, 
a difference and a new understanding of what samba, what samba and what carnival is. Um, in Asaksa's Samba Carnival, uh, it started in summer of 1981 and today it draws an audience of close to 100,000 every August. Uh, not 100,000, 500,000, I apologize. <laughs> And it's become a, the showcase for samba, the showcase for Brazilianness in Japan. Hailing from Tokyo, Hokkaido, Osaka, and, and Saitama prefectures, there's others. Um, contingencies are divided into two leagues, S1 with 150 to 300 members and S2 with 30 to 150 members. The S1 leagues are required to have a float and a truck and a PA system although the PA truck can also be the float. The team must sing, dance, and perform an original samba. They're encouraged to meet a three element requirements, comissão da frente, the contingency from the front, the porta bandera, somebody who carries the flag, or, um, and at least four bayanas, and these are the dancing women in the center. Uh, and I'll look at this, this one over here is a bayana. Um, and this would be a Porta Bandera, right? Someone who carries a flag. Um, so failure to meet all the requirements will not inhibit participation in the carnival, but may exclude a contingent's participation in the Matsuri. The S2 contingencies are not required to have a float, but they need to have one PA truck, um, although multiple PA trucks are also admissible. Um, in 2019, eight groups participated in both S1 and S2 contingencies. Um, and the dates that the groups are established are also very telling. The younger groups don't seem to have enough members uh, to participate in S1 leagues. Um, this is all to say, this is a big production in Tokyo. And in order to get there, we have to have a lot of practice. Um, and so what ends up happening is that all this, a lot of these Tokyo area summer matsuri or summer festivals have samba and they have them because they are practicing for this big Asaksa samba matsuri. Um, so these are some pictures that I've taken in the past of the samba that is, um, that happens throughout Japan during summer. Um, so one of the more established groups is Gres Nakamise Barbaros, uh, which participated in the first Asaksa Samba Carnival on June, August 29th, 1981. Um, they performed cover songs of existing sambas until 1991 when they wrote their first samba in Heru, Aoshiro no Hata. Bandera Azul y Branco is the title in uh, Portuguese and blue or and white flag is the title in English. It's written by Kagami Jun in both Japanese and Portuguese, and it simply makes reference to the colors of the contingent's flag and to the grand illusion that is Carnival. Um, and so when we look at these moments of, of Carnival, we see different aspects of this happen. So let's see if my links work. These are always fun to see. This is the 1981. <laughs> I'm 
I'm going to pause it and leave it right there with the audience, because I find that this particular aspect is very telling. Um, what we have here is the this early video of the Barbaros performances at Asaksa, um, where they are dancing, celebrating samba. They don't have any drummers. You can see that it's mostly just a PA system um, that is giving them the music. And the audience that you're seeing here quietly looks on. Um, and this is really telling because if we're supposed to be considering the give and take of performance, here you can see that the performers are giving and the audience is taking, but it is very, it is not the mutual giving back to the performers the energy that they need. Um, so it's an illusion of carnival. And this a Brazilian illusion of carnival is seemingly transferred to Japan, where there is now a recognition of class difference that demands equality. The Sama Matsuri consumes Brazil, um, except that in this case, we don't have the same context. So it is religionless, it is classless, it is raceless, it is sexualized, and it is a feminized Brazil. Brazil is further displayed for consumption in the Japanese film Akaneiro no Yakusoku, Samba do Kingyo. Released in 2012, it offers the possibility of friendship between the Japanese and Brazilian communities. The film tells the story of two children, Ricardo and Hanaku, who find a mythological blue goldfish. Ricardo's mother is a dekaseki who has been recently fired from her job and is considered considering returning to Brazil. Hanako's dad owns a goldfish farm that like the other goldfish farms around them is increasingly finding it difficult to survive financially. Through a fantastical performativity of discovery that bridges past and future, as well as here and there, the film transfers the characters from their droll lives uh, to a mythical pa mythological past that opens them up for future possibilities. Now, here I have the, if it works, hopefully. This is the trailer. ここ どうしたの金魚。お母さんが言ってた。あの、どこに住んでんだ、あの金魚な。うちの未来が変わったんだぞ。おじさん、それ欲しいな。このテーマパークの新版青い金魚。相手子供なんだからさ、やめなさい。これ
the trailer always confuses people because there's so much going on. Um, but what I want to talk today about, obviously, is Samba. But the film focuses on these two children that you just saw in the clip, um, Ricardo and Hanako, as they seek to protect this goldfish uh, from the adults who only see it as see for, see it for it, its exchange value. Here, Shiozaki's setting is Yamato Koriyama. It's a real city in the prefecture of Nara. And he likes to depict, it's also his hometown. So he likes to set his films there in order to de depict how everyone is struggling. Hanako's dad is, uh, owns the, farm, the goldfish farm in the declining industry while Ricardo's mo mother faces unemployment and eviction as a decaseki. Um, when she finally approaches a city hall employee, and you saw her on one, one piece there in the trailer where she was standing on a desk and she starts yelling and he tells her that the city can't help her because she's not Japanese. Um, this character says, even Japanese are now experiencing hardship while living their lives. We're offering homes to those residents so we don't have any more homes to give to foreigners. What if you return to your home? This dismissal of her needs as an immigrant pushes her to capitalize on the goldfish. Realizing that the mayor sees a use value in the goldfish, she exchanges it for a place to live. And she hopes that by having this place, she can reestablish her broken uh, dreams and her broken fantasy of what Tekasegi de de life is. The only place that Ricardo and his mother are visible is in that Brazilian cafe that you saw, where they spend their first night after being evicted. Here, the Japanese owner is Carlos, and he exalts Brazil, and more importantly, Samba. When a city employee complains about her day and her job, he looks at her and says, you suck at your job and you don't have a guy. You're the one that said you wanted a change. Don't underestimate the spirit of Samba. And when Ricardo and the mother enter the cafe later, he suggests to her, why don't you teach my students some real Samba? Uh, the phrase that he uses in Japanese is, uh, Homba no Samba, to differentiate it from what is being taught in Japan uh, by and for Japanese. According to this character, Samba can change anything. And in the end, it does. It's through the performance of Samba that the film seeks to resolve the plot, becoming something that performativity theorist Diana Taylor suggests shapes their sense of self, of community, that organizes scenarios of interactions, conflict, and resolution. By disrupting the mayor's press conference for the news theme park that could destroy the community, the Samba Parade bears witness to a mythological, fantastical, and comical conclusion that blends Samba with Capoeira. I am going to go ahead and share a clip for you.
奴隷者私は私は市長ですよ市長あんまりもうおしまいですよ Dr. Rivas, I'm so sorry, you're still muted. I am still muted, you are correct. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I am going, uh, so I'm gonna go backtrack a little bit and just talk about that last section of the film in which the, uh, the film blends samba with capoeira in order to witness this mythological, fantastical, uh, in order for the audience to witness this mythological, fantastical and co uh, comical conclusion. At the very end, a city hall employee invites Ricardo's mother to join the parade and offers her a samba costume. And this is the last part in which she gets rendered visible after having been rejected by the Japanese community. So this representation of samba, much like the festivais and matsuri, move between proximity and distance in a way that allows Japanese Brazilians to commodify their Brazilianness. The musical performances highlight a commodified, marketable, tertiary multiculturalism that is a relatable, relatable and consumable for the audiences. And yet, while immigrants are denied inclusion in national narratives, the continuous use of these people in the advertisements of luxury goods highlights their distal, distal consumption becoming yet another example of Japan's new multiculturalism. Moreover, they look for social mobility away from current dekasegi associations with lower socioeconomic class. This example depicts how they're able to commodify their Brazilian bodies on stage in order to increase their social, socioeconomic mobility. Japan's multiculturalism allows them to do this without engaging in the national debate on immigration and multiculturalism, precisely because the globalized capitalized world emphasizes the economic needs of a country instead of the individuals that deliver the services. This provides the socioeconomic conditions that attract not only Japanese Brazilian dekasegi, but also other immigrants to Japan. Despite their contributions to Japan's economy, Japanese media and politicians depict these immigrants and their cultures distally becoming yet another example of the contradiction of multiculturalism in Japan. Thank you.
Great, thank you so much, Professor Rivas, for that um, stimulating talk. Um, so at this point, we'd like to move into the Q&A portion of our event today. So feel free to, um, at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the Q&A button. So if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to share um, with Professor Rivas, please feel uh, to add those there, and we'll get through as many of those as we can. Um, so while we're waiting for folks to kind of collect their thoughts and everything, um, I have lots of I have lots of questions, and I'd love to hear your your thoughts on a few things. I mean, one of the things that really struck me uh, when you were talking about about uh, kind of I guess maybe let's call it the cultural work that samba does in Japan. Um, you were, you mentioned, for instance, at least two things. One was the the difference between I guess the kind of what's going on with samba and what's going on with what is it poho? I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the ways in which these the different associations are actually um, associated um, uh, attend to different types of performance there. Um, but along the same lines, I was wondering about this notion of, of what Samba does in terms of offering at least the promise of some uh, release, um, release, you, I think you said it in terms of um, from Dekasegi life, uh, in terms of the pleasure that's there. I mean, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you call the politics of pleasure and what what's the nature of the pleasure in that context beyond just the kind of sexualization of, or, you know, of female bodies or, um, and how that works in relation to this kind of um, neoliberal you know, Japanese state uh, and what it, it imagines to be some notion of freedom in particular. So Samba is an interesting thing, right? It's, it's one of those things that belongs to everyone in Brazil um, because of these policies that were enacted in the 30s. And yet, in many ways, it really belongs to a specific group of people, right? It belongs to those who can, A, pay a lot of money to participate in these carnivals, but also they see this as a way of escape, right? The pleasure comes from the escape, the escape of the mundane um, for the participants. And the audience participates and comes into this and receives pleasure from the energy that is expounded, but also the music and other aspects. What becomes interesting is the transfer though, however, to Japan, right? So what happens when Samba goes into Japan and how are we consuming it and how who is consuming it um, and who is performing it? Um, often the so this Asakusa Matsuri started in the district of Asakusa. And if you look at like the early videos of uh, their carnival parades, um, you see that it they tend to emphasize that there are the, the nakamise, which are the different stores and kiosks that align the, um, the, the route to the temple in Asakusa, right? So it's, at first, it started off as a way of bringing people to this shtamachi, this area that was in many ways holds a lot of different aspects of Japanese culture, but increasingly had less internal tourists, right? We know that we have external tourists. Everyone takes a picture outside of the gates there in Asakusa. Um, but the internal tourism is one of the things that motivated this Matsuri. As to why uh, they chose Samba, I honestly, I've looked and I'm still not finding it as, as well as I wish, you know, I wish that the answer just came out of the archives and would just bang us on our head, but that's not how research goes. Um, but it's this idea then, from what I can see in carnivals in other countries that use Samba, it's this association with wearing less clothes that tends to associate with hot summer months, right? So the uh, ability to um, wear less clothes and dance and celebrate and kind of be yourself, which is what the idea of Samba was, right? Es escaping and being able to receive pleasure from the, your escape of the everyday. Um, and it, and that escape is pleasure for both the audience and for the performers, right? Um, however, as we've gone on throughout the years, we still have this escape, but now it's 
very much rooted within Japanese matsuri. So if Brazilian festivals happen, they tend to have fuho, they tend to have, um, they tend to have J-pop, Brazilian pop, uh, MPB, Musica Popular da Brasil, um, different things like that, as opposed to samba, right? And so that's where the stark difference is that you start seeing, is that the, the idea that all Brazilians dance samba is an untruth, right? <laughs> um, and that idea that gets shifted onto the immigrants when they arrive to, Brazil, to Japan is the idea of, oh, you're Brazilian, you must dance samba. And oftentimes they find themselves having to learn samba <laughs> when they arrive in Japan or things of that nature, right? So it's a new association for them of Brazilianness that they never had encountered before or they never done in Brazil when they lived there. Um, whereas Fojo is and Pagoji is something that they partook in. And that was an aspect of their uh, weekends or week weekday nights or whatever in Brazil. And so that continues in Japan, whereas they adopt a new thing in Japan in order to um, claim a Brazilianness. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That's, that's really helpful to think about. And it's really interesting to think about what it means to, I mean, as, as an immigrant in this case, to, to kind of perform to make oneself legible to this relatively kind of reductive notion of what Brazilianness is, um, and kind of what I mean, what the costs of that happen to be in terms of you know, visual consumption, but then also, I mean, I, this notion of of uh, being oneself <laughs> um, and how kind of how fraught that is in this in this context when when one is so hyper visible in this context is really interesting. Yeah. So we have um, several questions in the chat that are arriving. So I'll start with the first one from Holly Smith, um, who says, uh, at whose name you smile, which is great. Uh, so big question, how is your work received in Japan? Is this a self-examination folks are up for having? I know this might be a big can of worms question, uh, Holly Ann McNair. So she go ahead. Um, yeah, that's a former classmate. <laughs> from my high school who is now a teacher at my alma mater and apparently her students are tuning in. <laughs> so yay, go McNair, <laughs> go Cougars. Um, <laughs> throw it in always. Um, yes, yeah, so this, I presented mostly, I present mostly in the US. So the first question is about presentation and uh, reception. So I present mostly in the US and in Brazil. Um, I've only presented a few times in Japan and the times that I have presented, it tends to be for American studies audiences, which are different than Japanese studies. So um, the question of, of, of reception is always a way of thinking about how we're presenting, right? So in the US, I, when I say I present in the US, I present at conferences on Asian studies, Asian American studies, Latin American and Latin American studies, and then within Latin American studies, Brazilian studies as a whole. Um, and in Brazil, I presented in mostly Asian studies context. Um, so the idea of who is listening to you is kind of like who follows you or who can understand, uh, not can understand you, but can go on your tangents, right? <laughs> um, and that's one of those ideas, again, of audience that we have to consider. Um, so in terms of reception in Japan, um, literary scholars, <laughs> I guess uh, since my field is technically literature and I, I move into cultural studies and, and delve into some anthropological work, but not a lot. Um, it's often they like to hear the different theories of how to apply literary theories, uh, either old or new or what I'm coming up with in terms of race and movement of peoples. Um, in the literature, and they really enjoy that. Um, they like how I read film. They're always like, oh, I thought that film was boring if they saw it. <laughs> or they'll make a comment. They're like, suddenly it's, it's interesting again. Um, and so 
it really is one thing that I know that uh, Dr. J Jackson and I talked about at one point, which is how do we use what theories are we using and how are we uh, understanding the population that we are, uh, the population and the artifacts that we're researching, right? So I am not Japanese, right? I am Puerto Rican um, from Jersey City, go McNair, last little go McNair thing. <laughs> um, and I have no, this is not my culture whatsoever, right? And I am very cognizant of that, that I can research and I can say what the film is saying, I can interpret and put in theories, but I can't necessarily say this is how the community feels. This is what the film suggests that the, the community might say. This film represents a community in this particular way, and I can apply theories such as performativity theories that I was doing today or Asian American theories or things like that to it, the text, but I can't go beyond, I can't go beyond that because this is not, uh, this is not a type of participant uh, research that would be like anthropology or sociology um, research as a whole. We try to step back and this is as much as I can say. I like to, in my research, showcase what the immigrants say. So today I didn't give that that much, but my larger projects do give voice to the immigrants by translating them, by putting uh, their works in context with bigger works that are often read, such as Ishikawa Tatsuzo Sobo or uh, NHK dramas. And the NHK is uh, basically Japanese version of PBS, uh, Nihon Hosoku Ko Kokai, Kyokai, Kyokai, <laughs> Japan Broadcasting Corporation. Um, but these particular things give one sided pictures, right? Museums give another side of the picture. And what I like to do and what I try to do with my research is to offer another side by offering the immigrants' own words. Great, thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, I, I was also struck um, by, I mean, we've talked a little bit about methods and, and maybe we can talk a bit more about like what methods you find particularly useful, both for, you know, kind of telling a fuller story about, about the kind of cultural phenomena that you're interested in, but also uh, methods that might disrupt some of these tendencies, maybe in Japanese studies that are kind of overly literary or kind of overly, uh, invested in a certain kind of canonical archives that might not actually um, align very neatly with the kind of much messier and some ways much more interesting kind of things that you're interested in talking about. So I was thinking about ethnography or you know what what what's the nature of, of some of the, the research methods that you're using as well that might be useful for students to hear more about. So um, we have another question here from uh, Zara Espinosa who says, uh, Dr. Rivas, thank you for the awesome work. I loved your consistent and constant use of the word consumption in your presentation. Would love to know and better understand why you made such an impactful, in my opinion, provocative in a good way. Word choice. It's powerful. Um, honestly, <laughs> this is something that has been coming back to me more and more um, as I look. Um, and I... I put that one slide that had the history of the Dekasegi next to the advertisement of um, Bradesco, which is a bank in Brazil. And it says on the bottom, the tagline, you probably couldn't read it. It said, so complete, it's even in Japan, right? With the model pulling her eyes out. And that, the, that particular image of the pulling eyes and this, uh, this, obsession really with an orientalist image of eyes um, is a way that people sell and consume Asians, right? Um, in Brazil, it becomes very interesting because there is, the, the, and this is one of the things that we were talking about previously, is that you can't necessarily take theories from the US and kind of place them immediately into another culture because 
they're they don't always fit they don't have the same history they don't have the same race uh race and ethnic studies history um that we have and so this is one thing that we always warn students when we talk about um japanese studies in latin america is this uh is the words that are used in Latin America to describe um, their friends often cutesify <laughs> what in the US would be considered um, a racial slur. And so there's two ways of thinking about this, right? And, and scholars are all often at, a, at their wits end <laughs> because there's this there really is this way of consuming the other um, that allows us to be able to tell their story and to take their story and to not allow others' stories, uh, not allow their stories to be told in some ways. Um, and this is often, we see this, and, and, and the word consumption itself comes from this, a lot of the multiculturals and the multicultural uh, def definitions of multiculturalism that we have, which talk about um, our everyday multiculturalism, right? Like how do we, how would a first grader celebrate multiculturalism in their school, right? And um, we can say that often you, you, they wear their cute little clothes from countries and then they bring in food and they might dance a little dance and woohoo! great, we are multicultural. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm being cynical here uh, because there's so much more to be done, right? Um, I, when I, I, I have a foster child and I'm talking to their school about working in Japanese language classes and other things and Spanish classes and trying to do some more things in there. And one of the things that I'm, uh, I'm always very, I always feel it's very important to emphasize is this idea that all of these things, right? The language, the dance, the costumes, uh, you know, these national costumes, all of these things are just one aspect that we can consume. And there's so much more um, underneath what they call the iceberg, the cultural iceberg um, that we need to understand of these cultures. And so in many ways, we, need, in order to get there, we have to stop exotifying and consuming um and it, this is hard right like we all do it in certain in certain ways um but in order to consume uh in order of thinking about co uh, consuming that comes from multicultural studies that comes from the um the idea of pleasure that comes from um performance studies as uh audiences uh view and consume the uh, the media that is on stage or on screen or other places. Um, I really do think that we consume culture and I really do think that we consume others. Um, we don't mean to, uh, we don't understand that we're doing it, but in many ways, everything that we everyone does is a performance. Um, and because of that, there is, it's, uh, the performance is really only showing us what we want to do and how we want others to see us. And we change that on a minute by minute basis, second by second basis, depending on who you're with. And we're so used to it that we don't notice that we're doing it anymore, which I kind of find fascinating. Great, thank you so much. Um... No, there's lots more to say about this notion of consumption, and I appreciate uh, the question. In fact, um, I think let's see, you know, maybe uh, maybe kind of picking uh, picking up on some of that. I, I'm I'm interested too to th to think a little bit about. I guess it's it's related to something like the the question of escape or, or freedom, but then also, um, you know, like what does consumption do in this context, and 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 you know how. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk kind of framing things in terms of a kind of neoliberal frame. So, and uh, we've talked a little bit about, you mentioned here too from Stanley Fish, this notion of the, the boutique um, multiculturalism and and what it means at this particular moment 
and I say this particular moment in terms of like after the events of last summer and you know in the last you know two years I think in particular um, with Black Lives Matters with with um, the rise in anti-Asian um, and Asian American violence you know a kind of um, you know, there's the, the kind of performative, speaking of performativity, there's a kind of performative allyship that I think that, you know, kind of um, draws on a certain notion of either colorblindness or um, tolerance, if not kind of uh, celebration of multicultural identity as a way to, in some ways, maybe deflect or not really address some of these deeper concerns about like actual questions of equity. And so I was thinking about the, that some of these um, these conversations uh, now in relation to to um, the the different images you showed. So one of the 1981 performance that seems very much you, you I think you highlighted in a really great way this lack of reciprocity. There's all this energy going out, but very much the performance are performers aren't getting anything back from the audience. And I wonder a little bit about about what that means in the context of something like the the Asakusa Samba or these other kind of spaces where. Um, Maybe there's more energy now because it's been it's been more kind of routinized. But I, I do wonder about what the the value of multiculturalism is in these spaces. I mean, particularly now thinking about the Olympics and the ways in which there are these moments where it becomes more profitable, like literally more profitable, to announce one's multiculturalism or one's one's willingness to do that in Japan. So could you talk a little bit more about? about that or how you've seen that change in the, in the, in the years that you've been thinking about these, these issues or doing this research? Yeah, um, I've actually, uh, there's been in all the different uh, social media communities that I'm in, uh, there's been one going around these past few days on Naomi Osaka. Um, and so if you're, you're not familiar, Naomi Osaka is a tennis player. Um, she plays for Japan um, and she is mixed race um, black and Japanese. One of the things that I find really fascinating about her is that she's really used her platform, right? Um, as this, you know, internationally renowned, uh, tennis player to say without saying a lot, um, because, uh, it's, it comes in the form of face masks, um, which is where she got a lot of critique. Um, every time she played, it, I, I believe it was the US Open, I can't remember precisely, um, but in the past few matches, she, anytime she's on the, U, in US particularly, she'll wear face masks when she plays and each of her face masks, are they're just black with white names, um, just with letters and the, the words on them are the names of, um, African Americans who have died at the hands of police brutality in the US. And what I find really fascinating about her and what's been uh, what people have been talking about is that at the beginning everyone loved Naomi Osaka, right? Everyone thought she was awesome. Um, she's bringing Japan fame. She is um, she's a great tennis player and they would compare her to the Williams sisters and all these fun things. And then, and it was precisely because she just smiled and didn't say much, right? She was cute, she was young. Um, she always has a smile on her face and no one really talks about any, and you know, anything else. There started being more and more conversations regarding rates when she started being hired for different campaigns. Right, and, and here again, we can talk about consumption. But um, one that I remember in particular was the Nishin, uh, the, the ramen, cup of noodles ramen company Nishin. Um, they did several ads and they kind of whitewashed her. <laughs> and, um, and the same thing with her, uh, with toys and stuff that, she, that have her likeness. Um, there's a lot of whitewashing that's going around there, right? So it's a lot of skin lightening and a lot of things that um, unfortunately is prevalent in the beauty industry in Asia, Latin America and other countries, right? This uh, prevalence for uh, skin lightening creams and different things like that, right? Um, that's 
that's also a reason why in fashion magazines in Japan, for example, you'll see uh, more models who are part are, are are mixed race with white. Um, mixed race other models are, find it harder to get jobs in Japan. So mixed race uh, Latin America, you can be that's fine if as long as that Latin America is predominantly white, right? Um, and they prefer lighter colored hair too. Um, and so there's a lot of different things that are preferred in terms of advertisement, right? So they want to consume this, they want this. And this is very much stemming from the Meiji period, 1868 onwards, where they're traveling to, where Japanese are sending different uh, people to different countries to understand constitutions, to understand government, to understand religion, understanding all of that. This is one of those things that we talk about when we talk about the opening up of Japan. And a lot of those ideas of race that we have today on uh, pre promoting whiteness and uh, all these different things, some of them are rooted as we can look at the uh, the white makeup of Kabuki or Heian period, we can go back then, but it also got imported and became a mainstay during the Meiji period. Um, and because of this, we have different things, different people that are looked at and different models that are looked at that at the beginning, if you're someone of mixed race that is not necessarily white, like Naomi Osaka, it became harder and harder to please her, um, her, uh, the people who were at, that were using her in campaigns, right? Because she spoke out and because her fans spoke out against um, the colorization and the colorism that goes on in um, the fashion industry in Japan. Um, and that platform then is used. And when that platform is used to talk about the BLM movement and to look at other things, you're shedding light on this particular thing that in many ways the Japanese government didn't want anything to do with. They didn't want to have to take a stance. They didn't want to have to understand what was happening through the different TV broadcasts in the morning. And so while internationalization and mixed race and globalization can be lauded for certain things like trade and commerce, um, when it comes to pushing Japan onto the international stage of political issues that they're not necessarily wanting to address, that's when it becomes troublesome. No, absolutely. And I, I um... I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about so many things now and, and, and it, it dawned on me when you were showing some of the, the um, kind of images of, of, of Samba and of these different kind of cultural figures. I mean, one of the things that strikes me, uh, I hadn't thought about this in terms of Naomi Osaka until you just kind of gave your explanation, but you know, I'm thinking about that kind of interesting intersection or confluence of, of two different types of anti-blackness there. I mean, so there's the kind of Latin American kind of European version um, that's, you know, that exists in, I mean, I think about Cuba and Brazil in particular as being effective, you know, I don't know if it's the worst, not that there's an, a competition, but there's a particular, there's a longstanding uh, uh, terribleness in those. Uh, but then also you're talking about the Meiji period, but even before that with the, the kind of, the ways in which that kind of anti-blackness that comes from that expansion into the new world with the Jesuits, right? And, and before that in the early modern period as well, you know how how um, how that is kind of sets the stage for the much more kind of virulent, much more kind of aggressive types of social Darwinists, say kind of types of of, um, of notions that, that come up in the, in the late nineteenth century. So, no, I think it's it is really helpful to think about um, you know, a company like Nike in this context and how it's positioning itself with regard to celebrities like Naomi Osaka or Colin Kaepernick, and deciding to again, perform a kind of wokeness for the sake of, of, of being on the right side of history, but also kind of recognizing with this kind of uh, diversifying consumer base, like what that might mean. It also strikes me that, that 
what what she mentioned is is also helpful to think more about. Yeah, I'm thinking about Anne Maria Shimabuku's uh, webinar most recently, and she's talking about the case of Okinawa, and as is you know um, the great uh, Mitsuo Ihara Carter, you know, on kinds of these issues and what it means for Japan as a client state, you know, of the United States to fall in line with let's just call it you know white supremacist kind of tendencies as a way of performing again a kind of loyalty to at least ideologically some of these these systems right um and so the what you're talking about the kind of the superficial consumption um and the 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 affable kind of rapport with someone like naomi osaka when she's keeping her mouth shut or keeping her her masks, her masks, kind of un, unfaunted or something. I think is it's really interesting to think about in that context as as well, right? Where where Japan's inheritance of or kind of blind eye towards some of these things is really based on that kind of subordination, you know, by by this kind of current colonial kind of rapport with the United States. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if we think about this in terms of mixed race, um, how we were just talking about with Naomi Osaka. Um, we can th think about the, uh, while we've had mixed race children in Japan for a while now, <laughs> since, you know, uh, since the Jesuits and everything like that, we don't talk about it. Well, we start talking about it in, after World War II, right? We start talking about the Konketsuji, the mixed race children, or, the, um, and then that term started changing and it's changed throughout the time. But one of the things that I'm always interested to, uh, to think about it are the different mixed race children that were born out of occupation, right? Um, and one of the, and the reason that I talk about this is that there it, were different um, orphanages, but there's one in particular and off the top of my head, it's not coming to me. It will as soon as I finish talking and you start talking again. <laughs> because that's the way my brain works. Um, it, and uh, Pearl Buck was involved in this by funding it and all sorts of things. And I like saying that because West Virginia, Pearl Buck uh, <laughs> and all that fun stuff. Um, but the idea there is that they didn't quite know what to do with the mixed race children after World War II. Um, a lot of the mothers abandoned the children and the US um, at least from through gen, uh, general headquarters did not want to claim them, right? So then there became this whole big mess of mixed race children and what do we do with them? Um, we don't want to give them uh, US nationality. We don't want to claim them as Japanese. So they kind of sat in the middle for a while. And one of the, um, one of the orphanages, what they decided to do was actually to send them to Brazil. Um, when they were 18, when they aged out to send them to Brazil because Brazil was this imagined utopia of race, right? <laughs> and um, it failed, it failed miserably. <laughs> um, they sent one group of children over, um, mostly males to the Amazon um, to farm the Amazon and they, they kind of lost it, um, lost touch with them. And this became this, uh, what becomes interesting though, it is that idea of Brazil. What, how was Brazil talked about at that time in the 1940s, 1950s, and how can we compare it today? Um, I think that there is still this idea of Brazil as a racial paradise that doesn't take into account the specific nuances of race uh, of race in Brazil at all, um, but uh, at the other on the other hand, uh, there is this interesting piece of history <laughs> that we get to examine a little bit more because that links Japan and Brazil together further back than De Kasegi times. No, that's fascinating. And I don't, I don't know a lot of that history, so I'm learning a lot. I mean, I, I, that's really fascinating to think about kind of um, the products, you know, of some of these, these, these um, pre, post, <laughs> pre and post colonial intimacies, and, and kind of like what, you know, where these, where these kinds of these different circuits happen to, to end up. It's really fascinating. I'd love to hear more about that. In fact, um, 
So I think that's, um, we have time for maybe another question or so. Um, there's one question, I think it's relatively straightforward. This is um, uh, from an anonymous attendee who says, who asks if, um, is Asaksa Samba today um, uh, one of the kinds of festivals uh, which is different from the Samba festivals in other countries? Um, so I guess that they're asking at a certain level whether or not, um, or maybe how this differs maybe from some of the other types of Samba festivals in other maybe outside of Brazil or in other countries? Um, I think they're similar, um, but, and here is where we get the, um, we get a lot of the information, uh, we get our information from looking at not just Samba, but we look at, for example, Andean music, right? There's a great uh, book called, I believe it's Instimate, Intimate Distance, right? Um, that talks about Andean music and the consumption of Andean music in Japan. Um, and when we look at these things, we see that there are different, going back on the word, consumers of this, right? There are the consumer, uh, you, always you have dancers, you have musicians, you have all these different people that want to perform, but then you also have the audience. The question is, how is this music being passed on, right? Who? How are we learning? How are we, uh, are we having any connection, not just with uh, Brazil, but maybe with the Br Japanese Brazilian community? Uh, who, who are we dancing for? Who are we playing for? Who are we composing for? And how do we um, come across in our performance, right? Um, there's always a question of authenticity, right? Um, and it's all it's always a hard question to answer. Um, but what I come back to time and time again when I think about this particular research is how are we using our privilege, right? How are we um, as consumers perhaps of samba, as people who like to dance or watch or whatever, how are we using that to help perhaps um, do some kind of coalition to support immigrant rights in Japan? Um, the answer, unfortunately, is not a lot is happening on that end. Yes, there is interaction between the Japanese Brazilian community and the Samba Matsuri and those people who are consuming that, but are we going further, right? And I think that if we were to consider that, um, especially in regards to anti-racist pedagogy, we need to think about how we are moving these ideas forward. How are we moving uh, our, our love or our consumption and how are we allowing that to motivate us to go to Brazil, to learn there in Brazil, uh, to travel to other Samba um, festivals throughout the world and perhaps to also um, use our voice to to for to talk about immigrant rights oh, i appreciate um as a note to end on i mean i think that's really important i mean i think we're all trying to and part of the the one of the goals at least of the project um is to i mean open spaces like this to hear from incredible scholars like yourself who are willing to share you know this this kind of research but then also to to really emphasize the ways in which this kind of research, um, you know, can connect, can kind of connect to these kind of larger, larger kind of causes or activist um, movements, even, uh, so that it's not just as um, as uh, cosmetic, right? That there is a kind of deeper. I mean, a lot of these, uh, whether that's the film for all of its other ways in which it's interesting, or or some of these festivals to kind of think, kind of look deeper and to kind of think about. How these these cultural products are actually coming out of, of communities that are marginalized um, in Japan and otherwise, and to really kind of take that seriously. So I hope that that some of the folks who, like me, were largely ignorant of, of um, um, some of uh, some of the context that you describe, you know, might be inspired um, to kind of think more about about some of these. We have um, one final final comment, I think from our Toyota visiting professor and JSAP uh, collaborator, um, uh, Hua Jishin, who says, this is just a comment. 
Uh, this is a very interesting, it's very interesting to hear about the cultural consumption uh, in relation to migrants' rights. Uh, Zainichi Koreans festivals definitely have always embedded some kind of political agenda. So it's a very important and interesting comparative point. So thank you so much for the stimulating talk today. Um, so there's, there's that. And then maybe finally, uh, Sara Espinosa once more has said, um, thank you uh, so much yes to everything you said, thank you. I've literally been snapping my fingers in resonance and cheering affirmations out loud for the wisdom, insight, and truths you're sharing, thank you. Uh, so, and she's thanking me as well for moderating. So I think that's a really, speaking of celebration. So um, with that, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zayla Rivas for, for sharing your work with us. Um, we look forward to reading more of it. and. Um, Please join me uh, in thanking uh, Professor Rivas for a really stimulating talk today. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, uh, our pleasure, absolutely. Right, take care, everyone.